So I came to JGI in 2004, and Eddie asked me to come and begin a, a user program. Uh, and as I was thinking about uh, whether I should do that, um, I didn't know what a user facility was or what a DOE user program looked like, so that did not enter into my thinking. Um, but there was no night call, and almost nobody dies here. Um, but more importantly, it was an opportunity to be part of something big and important, and to do important work. And I can tell you that the most gratifying thing about being at JGI, and I know many of you share this feeling, is the ability to go home and tell your kids that you're doing something important. Um, although my mother still struggles with the concept that her son, the cardiologist, is sequencing dirt. <laughs> but we're still working on it. So, what I wanted to talk to you about today was sort of how a user facility works and how we do what we do. Um, and a user, as a user facility, I now know 10 years into it, um, really needs three things. You need users. Can't be a user facility without users. You need capabilities that you serve to those users. And you need science that drives the whole boat. And uh, it's really the science where things start. You need to start with important questions. And once you've identified those important questions, either by ourselves or, or with, our, um, with our colleagues in the user community, we are often developing new capabilities, developing foundational data sets that lead to high visibility publications that advertise that capability, and then we can serve that capability to, to users. And you do this over and over again and show the users how to do something pretty soon. They say, I want to do that too in my circumstance. And I thought I'd use as an example of this um, the metagenomics because um, metage the term metagenomics was brand new when I came to the JGI. I'd never heard it before I came to the JGI. Um, uh, and the the project that really began us down this road was uh, a study from Jill Banfield at UC Berkeley um, studying acid mine drainage. And the, cl the critical problem she was studying was um, these abandoned mines basically have sulfuric acid running out of them. And the reason for that is there, there are microbes in the, in the mines that take pyrite, fool's gold, and convert it into uh, free iron ions and, uh, and hydrogen. Sulfuric acid, and Jill knew that it was a microbial process, but she couldn't grow these bugs, and wanted to understand what their what their metabolism was all about. So she came to, to Eddie, and uh, we put together this. Uh, they put together a program uh, to try and sequence directly the DNA from the from the environment. Here's this, this purple mat is growing on top of the sulfuric acid. It's got a pH of about one. They extracted DNA from the whole community, not just from an individual organism, which had been done hundreds of times, but um, uh, from the whole community, and then sequenced them, and, and uh, Dan Roxar and his group managed to put the pieces together into several um, complete genomes. And in looking at those genomes, you could tell what the genomes, were, what the organisms were able to do and what parts of metabolism they were missing, and that allowed her to actually end up growing these bugs in, these bugs in the laboratory. And so that was the first time um, and, uh, a, a microbial genome had been assembled from, uh, from uh, without first purifying the organism. And so all, all well and good, right? Metagenomes to solve problem. Well, not, not so fast. In um, very, uh, in very low complexity uh, environments with only a few organisms like the acid mine, uh, you can do that. As the number of species gets larger in different kinds of environments. We now, there, we now know there are tens of thousands of, of organisms in soil. Uh, the assembly process gets harder and harder. Um, and so uh, uh, Alex Copeland and, and Dan and many others in the, in the institution have spent a lot of time in the last decade trying to improve those assembly algorithms. And Tanya and Rex uh, Malmstrom have developed single cell genomics so that from very complex environments you get individual cells without having to, um, uh, without having to assemble them. Um, but there's also the problem of in many of these environments, none of the data assembles, and a lot of it's just left as either very small uh, chunks of genome or, e or even individual reads. And Suzanne and her group have spent a lot of time working on these 
uh, environments and trying to figure out how to, how to, what to do if all of the data is in this unassembled sort of uh, um, heap. And one way to think about how that's done, so the process is generally called metagenome binning. And if we think of the genome as a parts list, here's a bunch of parts and kind of look like they're from a motor. Uh, and if you, if you have these sorts of pieces together, um, uh, you might have some clue what they were for. Um, metagenomes often look more like this picture on the right, just a big heap of stuff. And what you'd like to be able to do is parse them into groups that sort of made some sense to you so that um, you could begin to get an idea of, of what uh, the, the bins being a surrogate for, for actually a genome assembly. And recently through uh, an ETOP project, Jill Banfield's group has actually developed methods with uh, good enough binning and deep enough sequencing, you can get enough parts in the bin that you can actually assemble them into the, into the devices, into the genomes that, might, um, that are sitting in that bin. And so that's been an ongoing process for the last decade. Um, the tools have been developed and routinely provided to users in a way that lets them do things that they couldn't do by themselves. And the final piece of this was helping people to look at the data. So IMG was developed initially just to serve the genomes, the, the genes and the genomes, um, uh, to try and do some functional annotation of the genes that we sequence. But as time's gone on, we've added more and more different kinds of functionalities to IMG to help users be able to use, to use the genome data. Well, so things are changing. Things are always changing here. That's not anything new. Um, this comes from Tom Friedman quoted um, quoted this the other day in the New York Times. Uber, the first world's taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's, popular, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, has no inventory of its own. And Airbnb, the world's largest hotelier, owns no real estate. What a world, what a world. Something interesting is happening. This is uh, from Tom Goodwin, who actually wrote these words that Tom Friedman was quoting. So can you imagine a day when JGI, the leading environmental sequencing center, generates no sequence? I can. I don't think it's going to be any time real soon, but I can definitely imagine that that time is coming. And so, so what? Um, well, we know that time is coming now that Oxford Nanopore is more than just a, an endless discussion at, at meetings. There's actually a device. We actually have some, it actually generates sequence. Uh, and as technologies do, is getting better rapidly. So, so what are we going to do? Um, well, I think we're going to continue to do what we've always done, which is to take interesting science problems, develop technologies, and lower the barrier for users to, uh, to access them. So in one concept, um, following on the, the decade of work that, that people have done here in metagenomics, um, is to try and understand more deeply how microbial communities function. So here's, a, here's uh, organisms in a petri dish. We know we can sequence those. We have thousands of those sequences. We know that we can use single cell genomics and metagenomics to get at uncultivated organisms that, that are the majority of organisms that we're interested in. Um, but it still doesn't tell us exactly how organisms are functioning in, their, in their, the context of their specific communities. And we know for sure that organisms do behave differently uh, when they're in the context of their, of their natural environments than they do as isolates. And understanding that environmental context is really a key. And this has become a lab-wide initiative that you may or may not have heard about, but will hear about, called Microbes to Biome. Many of the JGI investigators are involved in this. And the idea is to understand microbial community function in, in its environmental context. And I'm just going to tell you about one application of that from the very high level, because you're going to be hearing from others about the, the, um, the specifics uh, of the kinds of experiments that I expect um, you all will be doing. But just as an introduction, we know that crop yields have to continue to increase. We'll need 70 to 100 percent more food by 2025. We also need biomass crops on top of that, so we need to make maximal use of the land that we have. Traditional breeding is probably not enough to get us there. And one way to help is to improve 
the interactions between plants and beneficial microbes that we know can improve plant growth and that may help us to solve this problem. Eddie likes to say that the next green revolution is going to be a brown revolution because it's going to be happening in the soil uh, at the roots and I think he's probably right. So the first side of this question is how do plants talk to, mi talk to microbes? We know that plants have genetic mechanisms uh, in place that in help to attract beneficial microbes to their roots. And John Vogel, uh, who's been now at the JGI for approaching a year, will be tackling this problem. Uh, and he's using the plant Brachypodium, which is a model grass. It's about this big, so you can grow a lot of them in the chambers that are now being built out in, the, <laughs> out in Greg's warehouse. He gave me a tour yesterday. They're coming along nicely. He's got an excellent JGI produced genome, and he's got thousands of mutants that he can look to see how a mutation in an individual gene uh, uh, causes changes in the, in the microbial composition. We also want to know how microbes talk to plants, which they clearly do. Um, and a number of investigators uh, here, shown at the bottom, Tanya, Susanna, Axel, uh, Matt, uh, Trent's probably on here, lots of others participating. Um, have come up with the idea of producing what's called a Berkeley, what we're calling a Berkeley-defined microbiome. This is a stable mix of root-associated uh, bacteria that we can combine with a plant, Brachypodium, that we're, we can grow and modify. These are organisms that we can grow and modify in the lab. Um, uh, the idea is to sequence their genomes if we don't already have them. Uh, Matt's already talked previously about these transposon mutant libraries that we can use to uh, look at functions of individual genes in these things. Well, what about the actual molecules that the, that the plants and the microbes use to talk to each other? We, we call these, these molecules um, uh, secondary metabolites um, or natural products. They're often produced in bacteria by complex clusters of genes. A few of them are shown here. And one of the first really important steps, Natalia uh, Ivanova and Amrita uh, Patty, before she left, developed tools for actually identifying these pathways. Really important, uh, really important um, contribution. But these things aren't normally made in bacteria in culture, which is what we usually have. And so Sam and uh, Jan Fong Cheng have been working on taking these pathways, modifying them, and figuring out how to get them to make these molecules and trying to predict what the, what the molecules might be. And then once you can make those molecules, you need to be able to measure them. So we've got uh, Trent Northern uh, and cronies on board to help us, uh, to help us analyze, those, uh, uh, analyze these molecules. Uh, Rex Malmstrom is interested in developing a high throughput strategy for figuring out how these, how these um, pathways being expressed in, in another organism could be applied to the plant root at scale to try and figure out what they do. And Yasuo Yoshikuni has been to, uh, be beginning to work on a device to actually be able to take these organisms and put them back into their natural environments and be able to see how they, uh, their, their uh, interaction with other organisms. These technologies are all critical for the problem of how plants and microbes interact, but they're at least as important for the JGI because just understanding where the pathways in it are is now a foundational data set that people are very anxious to get their hands on. If Sam uh, and the synthetic biology group can reproducibly produce these molecules uh, uh, in, uh, in culture that we haven't been able to produce before, that's a hugely important step, and lots of people will want that. Likewise, if we develop uh, these testing platforms where we can look at thousands of plants or thousands of, of uh, uh, microbes at a time, people will want access to those, uh, uh, to those platforms. So, so what are the lessons here? Um, the first is that I'm not leaving because things are changing. <laughs> Um, this is the most exciting time in JGI's history. I said this to Nikos the other day, and he says, so why are you leaving now? Um, and it's because it's always the most exciting time in JGI's history. JGI is on a trajectory, and will continue to be on a trajectory. So if I waited until it wasn't the most exciting time, I'd never get out of here. The sequencing world will definitely change. JGI needs to change with it. It's already happening. Uh, it will continue to happen. 
I think that understanding plant microbe and micro microbe interactions will be a big part of the next, next thing for JGI. Um, and JGI really doesn't have to worry about its future as long as it continues to make it easier for scientists who are interested in the problems that we're interested in to access the, te the technical capabilities that we develop and to lower the bar for scientists to get access to, to what we do. All right, so that's what's next for you. This is what's next for me. Uh, this is uh, our new house on Vashon Island. Vashon Island is, uh, sits between Seattle and Tacoma, and we're sort of in the middle of the island there. Uh, we'll be retiring the, there at the end of June. I'm going to spend uh, a lot more time on my bike. Uh, this is Jim's bike shop. I got shirts. I got a shop, but I got shirts. Uh, I'll spend a lot of time on the couch. <laughs> with my puppy, and I'm uh, thinking about doing a little teaching. <laughs> and so with that, I'll say goodbye, good luck, be well, and be happy. And I, I think Jim's presentation illustrates why he needs no introduction, <laughs> and why we miss him so much. Yeah, Jim is, uh, is uh, foundational. On the JGI, his ability to communicate, his integrity, his passion for science are, are quite rare. We have benefited from that. So, a couple of things for him. Here is incredible a 35-year uh, pin for having worked at UC for 35 years. Here you go. It's like. You know, and when Jim came to the JGI. Uh, we had just, you know, we're at the end of the human genome era, and all we were were focused on one project, you know, and one tube of DNA, and uh, and you know that didn't have a long future, and so Jim came and he figured out how to set up, convert us to a user facility. He was the one that that turned the ocean liner. We have user programs and user reviews and committees and user meetings, all kinds of, you know, we had our 10th year anniversary of our user meetings, you know, but it was really Jim that, that launched this. And then we didn't have, we had one program, and that was the Human Genome Program. And Jim's the one that launched the science programs that we have, metagenomics and plants and microbes. This is all the structure of the JGI. And then we had, uh, you know, it was so confusing, you know, <laughs> And, and he launched the project management office. That suddenly we had sort of a structure to hog. <laughs> and, and he shepherded all of these. And, uh, and so it is. We, we, JGI continues evolving. It's, and Jim thinks he's left, but, but Jim has not, does not. You know, I'm still this place. <laughs> well, <I'm, laughs> and so we'll be able to call on him. And <laughs> we'll be able to call on him. But, uh, but he really was such a foundational force at the JGI. And, and one of his contributions, which I, somebody said to me in describing Jim, was uh, you know pragmatic idealism. And you know think about how important science is, and how important lofty science and lofty scientific trajectories, important questions and important contributions, you know, can never be lost, you know, buried by reality. But, but you need a little pragmatism to get there. And Jim was always could connect the two, how to get it done as well as reaching for the, for the ideals. And so uh, we have another plaque for him. And this is the uh, Berkeley Lab plaque. And uh, it's presented to Jim Bristow, 1998 and 2015. Uh, Joint Genome Institute, in appreciation of your vital leadership and contributions in making the JGI world-class genome science facility. Okay, thank you.